The sixth commandment is, thou shalt not commit adultery. As we have seen in the fifth commandment, our Lord chose to broaden the scope of the sixth commandment when he taught, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The teaching on adultery contained within the sixth commandment finds its basis in the fundamental truth that God is the creator of heaven and earth and all that is contained therein. And God creates the human person as the apex of his creation. He creates the human person. He creates man, male and female, he created them. The design of the human person in complementary genders is part of God's plan and as such must be shown the greatest respect and honor. God is love, a communion of persons. In creating the human race in His image and likeness, God inscribed in the humanity of man and woman a calling, a vocation of love and communion. In so calling men and women, He bestowed upon them the capacity and the responsibility to do the same. Sexuality affects all aspects of the human person in the unity of his body and soul. It concerns affectivity, the capacity to love and to procreate. It concerns the aptitude for communion with others. And one's sexual identity, is, namely being male or female, should be acknowledged and accepted. The physical differences and moral and spiritual complementarity of the sexes are ordered toward the goods of marriage and the flourishing of family life. The harmony of the couple and of society depends in part on the way in which the complementarity, needs, and mutual support between the sexes are lived out. Men and women are created with equal dignity, and each has his or her role to play in the building up of the kingdom. Each of the two sexes is an image of the power and tenderness of God with equal dignity, though in a different way. The union of man and woman in the flesh imitates God's generosity and fecundity. All human generations proceed from this union. God creates man and woman so that they can find in themselves in the chaste union in holy matrimony a means by which to build their unity and the means by which to procreate children. In both of these, husband and wife participate in the goodness and the activity of God. Jesus came to restore creation to the purity of its origins. He interprets the sixth commandment strictly in the Sermon on the Mount. The tradition of the church has understood the sixth commandment as encompassing the whole of human sexuality. And with the sixth commandment comes the call of each of us to a life of chastity. Chastity is the virtue related to the sixth commandment. Someone who is keeping the sixth commandment can be said to be living a chaste life. Chastity involves the integrity of the person, the integration of sexuality within the person, and thus the inner unity of man in his bodily and spiritual being. Chastity involves the integrality of the gift, sexuality in which man's belonging to the bodily and biological world is expressed becomes personal and truly human when it is integrated into the relationship of one person to another in the complete and lifelong mutual gift of a man and a woman. The Catechism speaks of the integrity of the human person, that a human person who is living a chaste life, someone who is keeping the sixth commandment can be said to be integral or whole. Another way of saying this is 
not divided against himself or herself. The chaste person integrates the powers of life and love placed within him. The unity of the person depends upon this integrity, and a double life or speech against this unity is not to be tolerated. Chastity includes an apprenticeship in self-mastery, which is training in human freedom. Either one masters the passions or is dominated by them. Either one is moved by conscious and free choice, or one is moved by blind impulses or external constraints. One gains great dignity when he or she moves away from slavery to the passions and presses forward toward the goal of self-mastery by freely choosing what is good and by his diligence and skill effectively secures for himself the means suited to this end. Resisting temptation requires the appropriate means to do so, self-knowledge, self-denial, obedience to the commandments, the exercise of the virtues, and faithful prayer. Indeed, through chastity, we are gathered together and led back to the unity from which we were fragmented into multiplicity. Chastity is a virtue that is closely related to temperance, uh, the virtue that has to do with the proper use of physical goods. The virtue of temperance seeks to permeate the passions and appetites of the senses with reason. Self-mastery is a long and exacting work. One can never consider it acquired once and for all. It presupposes renewed effort at all stages of life, more intense Effort can be required at certain stages, such as childhood and adolescence. Chastity has laws of growth which progress through stages marked by imperfection and too often by sin. As with all the virtues, chastity is built up through many free decisions. Chastity is a personal virtue, but it also involves a cultural effort. One's chastity benefits the wider society and one has the right to grow in chastity, receiving an education that respects the moral and spiritual dimension of human life. Chastity is both a moral virtue and a gift from God, a grace, a fruit of spiritual effort. And it's the Holy Spirit who enables us to imitate in our own lives the purity of Jesus Christ. Calling upon the Holy Spirit is very, very important if one is to make progress in the virtue of chastity. The Catechism describes chastity as the integrality of oneself, the, the idea that one is whole, one is not divided against himself or herself. Under the influence of the virtue of charity, Chastity empowers a person to give himself or herself in such a way as to witness to God's fidelity and loving kindness. Chastity blossoms in friendship. Friendship is a self-giving that imitates Jesus' total gift of self for the sake of our salvation. Chastity is a promise of immortality, for human friendship points to God's friendship with man. Friendship is a great good for all, and it leads to spiritual communion. With the virtue of chastity, there are different forms according to one's state in life. A single person is called to be chaste. A married person is called to be chaste. A religious is called to be chaste, albeit in different ways for each. All who have put on Christ in baptism are called to chastity. One's baptismal promises include the pledge to chastity in one's effective life. Chastity is to be practiced in accord with one's way of life. Consecrated virgins and religious live the virtue of chastity in a way so as to give themselves to God alone with an undivided heart in a remarkable manner. Single people are called to practice chastity in continence. Married people are called to conjugal chastity. 
and the engaged are called to practice chastity in continence. The engagement period is a time of testing, a discovery of mutual respect, an apprenticeship in fidelity, and the hope of receiving one another from God. By reserving for marriage the expression of affection that belongs to married love, they will help each other grow in chastity.